Thank you, Alex. Thank you, uh, Radhakshan sir, and all the participants who are joined late in this evening. Uh, uh, doubt sir, let me thank uh, Learning Journal Surgery and uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yes, very uh, good. Yes. Let me let me at the outset thank Patra Radhakrishnan sir and the entire team behind Learning Jan Surgery for having uh, created a platform like this for uh, people to interact in this period of lockdown. Uh, let me apologize that this is my first time on a live teaching session, online teaching session. So uh, please excuse me if there are any 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 pitfalls or any any fumbling in between. Uh, I have been asked to speak on uh, colorectal cancers. Uh, but then I thought I'll focus on uh, rectal cancers because generally we have a tendency to talk on colorectal cancers as a common entity. Anatomically, they form part of the large intestine. But basically, other than that, uh, treatment-wise, uh, embryologically and oncologically, they are different. I'll tell you why. The <clears throat> thing is that colon, you know that basically it's an intraperitoneal organ, except for some parts of the ascending colon and some parts of the descending colon. It's basically an intraperitoneal organ. So once you operate, the other modality of treatment that becomes very important in colon cancer is the systemic chemotherapy. But when it comes to rectal cancer, it is an extraperitoneal organ. So the local regional recurrence is of more importance. And as a result of this, other than surgery, the other modality of treatment which becomes more important is radiation. So in colon cancer, it is surgery and chemotherapy, whereas in rectal cancer, it is surgery and rectum and radiation, which forms the main modalities of treating these cancers. So this basic difference we should understand and be thorough with. This has got a very practical importance, I'll tell you. For example, many a time we operate on sigmoid cancers and the surgeon usually writes in the operation notes that AR has been done. And then we send it to the oncologist for planning the adjunct therapy where the oncologist is confused whether to treat that particular case as a sigmoid cancer or rectal cancer. Because as I said earlier, if it's a sigmoid cancer, it becomes systemic chemotherapy. But if it's a rectal cancer, it becomes adjuvant radiotherapy. The basic difference is there. So it is very important for us surgeons while operating, especially on sigmoid cancers, to very specifically document where exactly the location of the tumor is because it is based on the surgeon's note or the surgical implication that the adjuvant therapy is going to be decided as far as colon is can, concerned it is systemic chemotherapy whereas if it's rectum is concerned it's going to be adjuvant radiation hope i am clear uh, sir am i audible and am i clear yeah very clear uh, dr madhu uh, thing is that uh, I don't know who the who the audience would be. Uh, I, I I was given the audience will be M MCH GI, uh, DNB GI, J surgery and MS General Surgery. So since I was not sure about the uh, about the audience type, I kept it somewhere between MS Surgery and MCH Surgical Oncology or MCH Gastro. So sometimes it may feel too simple for the uh, for the PGs who are doing the Surgical Oncology or a bit tough for PGs who are doing the surgery. But that's that's fair enough, are, fair enough, no problem. Yeah, fine. So that is the basic difference between the colonic cancer and rectal cancer. That's why I thought I'll focus today on rectal cancer and the implications for a surgeon on the updates on the rectal cancer. Now, I said earlier, the definition of rectum, which should be very clear, is 15 centimeters from the anal verge. The answer is 15 centimeters. What we should be very clear is that whenever we are talking about rectal cancer, we are talking about adenocarcinomas of the rectum. Whether it's 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter, or 15 centimeter, we are talking about adenocarcinomas of the rectum because they, all those adenocarcinomas, irrespective of where they arise, they are treated in a particular pattern. But if it's a squamous cell carcinoma, wherever it is, whether it's 1 centimeter or 2 centimeter, it is treated as anal canal cancer. And you know the difference between treating a rectal cancer, which is adenocarcinoma, and anal canal cancer, which is squamous cell carcinoma. In adenocarcinoma, it is surgery and radiation, whereas in case of squamous cell carcinoma, so the anal canal, it is just concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Surgery doesn't have a major role to play in anal squamous cell carcinoma. So throughout my discussion, I'll be focusing on adenocarcinoma of the rectum, and the definition of rectum is 15 centimeters from the anal bird, which should be very clear about. Now, if you look at the last 10 years or 15 years, there have been three major differences that have taken place in the management of rectal cancers. The first is the innovations or the developments that have taken place in terms of imaging. The second is the surgical implications or the surgical innovations. And the third and the most important one is a shift of the pendulum from the adjuvant setting to the neoadjuvant setting. For the couple of minutes, I'll be discussing. Let me start with imaging for rectal cancers. Now, if you look at 
various modalities of imaging available for rectal cancer imaging, it starts with transrectal ultrasound, MRI, and CT scan. And don't forget the time-tested per rectal examination. Now, TRUS is a very important modality of investigating early rectal cancers. For example, if you want to differentiate a T1, T2 lesion from a T3 or a T4 lesion, transrectal ultrasound is the imaging modality of choice. But very rarely do we get a lesion which is T1 and to most of the cancers that we deal with or I deal with in my center are locally advanced rectal cancer. But if you have an early rectal lesion and you want to differentiate a T1, T2 from a T3, T4, then transrectal ultrasound is the imaging modality because if it's a T1, T2, you can sometimes go in for a local resection methodologist. But if you want to image the nodal status or if you want to image the mesorectal fascia, then trust is not the imaging modality of choice, it is MRI. In addition to that, trust has got some disadvantage also because it is highly operator dependent. If the radiologist is good, then your trust report is going to be sensitive. But if the radiologist is not convinced or it is not a competent person, then there is a problem with that. The other disadvantage with trust is that in case of an obstructed lesion, trust doesn't come in handy. So in early lesion, trust is useful. But in all other lesions, T3, T4, or node positive lesions, where are looking at the extent of the lesion, the nodal spread, or the involvement of the mesorectal fascia. MRI is the imaging modality of choice in rectal cancer. A well-planned well CT is also good enough. But if you ask me which is the imaging modality of choice, I would say it is MRI. But we should not forget, as clinicians or surgeons, we should not forget the importance of per rectal examination. I think most of the people who are listening to me would agree that the simple or last imaging modality, or last methodology by which we decide a patient to go in for an AR or an ultra low AR or an intersting triple section or an APR is the on table per rectal examination that we do just before raping and preparing the patient. So the per rectal examination is very important, but if you ask me which is the imaging modality of choice, it is MRI that should be the first one. And then, as I said earlier in, in the previous slide, I said, if you want to delineate various layers of the muscles of the, of the rectal wall, it is Trust, but if you want to look at the nodal status or the circumferential mesorectal involvement or the adjacent structure, it is MRI. So I would say that in majority of our patients, MRI would be the primary modality of imaging. Now, as far as postgraduate is concerned, we should all remember this particular study. It was a Mercury study group conducted by Gina Brown that proved that MRI is superior to any other modality of imaging or perfect examination CT scan in delineating the surrounding structures or the mesorectal fascia or circumferential involvement, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So MRI is the current modality of choice. In addition to that, we should not forget that all the patients for rectal cancer should have a CEA evaluation done. And that is not for diagnosis, but for the prognostication, because in the post-operative period, this is the one modality by which we would like to follow up the patient to detect early recurrence or distant metastasis. In addition to that, all the patients should undergo a full colonoscopy because the incidence of synchronous lesions is about 30%. When I say synchronous lesion, I mean polyps and adenomas. Whereas the incidence of synchronous cancers is about 3%. So this is the best end data, but I don't know how much of this would be true. But again, it is a fact that all patients should undergo a full colonoscopy except the obstructed patients. In obstructed patient, you will not be able to do a full colonoscopy. But in such a patient, a full colonoscopy should be completed within six months of the surgery, especially in patients who are less than 50 years of age with a strong family history because they are likely to have polyps or adenomas higher up. So all patients, if possible, upfront full colonoscopy. If obstructed and you're not in a position to full colonoscopy, it should be done at the earliest after surgery. As far as the metastatic evaluation is concerned, CT of the chest and abdomen to look for lung and liver metastasis should be part and parcel of the initial evaluation. So CEA, full colonoscopy, CT scan of the chest and abdomen would suffice as far as investigation is concerned. PET scan, if you ask me, is there a role in initial evaluation? I would definitely say that as part of initial evaluation for any rectal cancer or for that matter, colonic cancer, PET scan doesn't have a role. But in case you have treated a patient and kept him on follow-up and the CA is rising and you want to pick up some metastasis or recurrence, then PET scan would come in handy. But as far as initial assessment is concerned, CT scan of the chest and abdomen would suffice as the metastatic evaluation. Now, the second thing that I would like to focus on is the surgical evolution that have taken place. As surgeons, you would all know that in rectal cancer surgery, TME is the buzzword and TME is the way forward. Again, this is a paper published in 1980s from the Hohenberger group. And you would know that Hohenberger is a famous German surgeon. What they did was they started operating on rectal cancers in 1974 and they continued till 1991. They compiled all the data of patients operated during this period 
you can see that there are 1,581 rectal cancer surgeries done during this period, 1974 to 1991. What happened in between was that they standardized the surgical technique somewhere around 1985. So they looked at the local recurrence before standardization and after standardization. From 1974 to 1985, they had a local recurrence of 39%. The survival was 50%. But once the TME was standardized in 1985, the result shows that the patients who underwent operation after 1985 to 1991, the local recurrence came down from 39% to 9.5%. So just by standardizing the surgery, you could reduce the local recurrence from 39% to 9.3%, whereas survival went up from 50% to 71%. This indirectly or directly proves that the most important prognostic factor as far as rectal cancer surgery is concerned is the proper TME and the surgeon is a prognostic factor. Now, again, to substantiate that fact, if you look at the historical series published between 1970 and 1980, the local recurrence was around 25 to 30%. But if you know, look at the famous Dutch, German, EORTC, and the MRC trials, you can see that this 25 to 30% local recurrence came down to around 12% to 10% by standardizing the TMA circuit. Is the pointer clear, sir? Yes, sir. Very clear. So the, just by standardizing the surgery, you could bring down the local recurrence from 25% to 10%. And by addition of chemo radiotherapy, the recurrence was further brought down to 6% to over 9%. So this is the importance of having a standardized TME as your surgical armamentarium because by standardizing surgery alone, you can bring down the local recurrence significantly. Now the, now, the, now the laurels for having brought down a standardization of surgery goes to Bill Heal, but we should not forget Ernest Miles because I'll come to that particular slide later on. Bill Heal is credited with having, having popularized the concept of TME, but it was Ernest Miles in his initial paper published in 1908, 1908 who, who first defined the principles of rectal cancer surgery. Even in that article, if you read carefully, you can know that the techniques of total mesorectal birth excision was defined, but somewhere around it lost its importance and Bill Field had to reinvent the total excision and to standard excision. Now, if you look at Basinstock experience, Basinstock is the place where Bill Heal's work, they found that the five-year local recurrence by standard TM is just 6% and 10-year local recurrence 8% just with the surgical standardization alone. So that is the importance of sticking to TME principles. And again, the surgical standards are not equal across the globe. If you look at the Swedish trial, you can see that local recurrence for surgery alone is 26%. But when you add radiation, the local recurrence comes down to 9%. So there's a huge improvement in the survival by addition of radiation. But when you look at the Dutch trial, the local recurrence is 11% with surgery alone. But if you give radiation also, the local recurrence comes down to 5%. So if you look at Swedish trial, the Dutch trial, the local recurrence of surgery alone is 25% in the Swedish trial, whereas it is only 11% in the Dutch trial. The difference is that Swedish trial did not have TME as a standard surgical technique, whereas the Dutch trial had TME as a standard surgical armamentary. So by standardizing surgery alone, you can bring down the local recurrence from about 20% to 10%. And by adding on radiation, you can further bring it down to single digits. So all throughout these slides, I've been trying to focus the importance of having a standardized TM method. And again, I don't think I need to talk about the, 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 the surgical principles because this is not a talk on the surgical technique. But if you look at the specimen, it's very clear that what a TMA should like, look like. The fascia should be glistening, intact, all around. There should not be any pits or any defects. So total mesorectal should be the standard of care. Again, you would know that autonomic nerve preserving TME should be the standard because the autonomic nerves are very important for a bladder function, sexual function, but if they are injured, you'll have bladder dysfunction, sexual, sexual dysfunction in terms of retrograde ejaculation. So autonomic nerve preserving TME should be the standard of care for all rectal cancer. And if you're able to do that, you can bring down the recurrence from about 20% to about single digits, five to 7%. Now, one major change that has been happening over the last five or six years is the concept of extra levator APR or extra levator APE. Let, let me explain what this extra levator APE is. Now, people started to do TME and then looked at their results. If you look at this particular result, in anterior resection, the circumference resection margin positivity is 10%. But if you do an APR, the circumference resection margin is 30%. This is from the famous Dutch trial. They had standardized TME, still the so CRM positivity was 30% APR. Local recurrence, 9.2% in patients who underwent an anterior resection, but 30% in patients under an APR. So in spite of having a standardized TME, people undergoing APR were not doing good. They were having more of CRM positivity and more of local recurrence. 
but in the same institutes, patients under AR were doing excellent, excellent. So what is the reason for that? They, they, they can analyze the specimens and found that as the distance from the anal verge increases, the recurrence comes down or the CRM positivity comes down. So people who have a lesion at around one, two, three, four centimeter are doing badly. Whereas when the lesion is about 10 to 15 centimeter, the recurrence rate or the CRM positivity is coming down. So there is some problem with patients who are having lesions at the lower part of the recurrence, that is about two to three centimeters or four centimeters. Or the other words, the patients undergoing APR were not doing as good as patients under an AR. Again, this is another data from the rectal trial, from the German rectal cancer trial. If you look at this, you can see that patients with lesions at 0 to 5 centimeter, the, the, the what is it, like, recurrence rate was 10%, but 10 to 15, 15 centimeter, the recurrence is 4.3%. In other words, lower rectal cancers were not doing as good as expected in spite of standard TME methods. This is, this is a further explanation. You may do a good TME in the upper part. The blue line shows that you have done a good TME, but the perineal part goes along the uh, along the red line. This is the standard or the conventional API that we all have, have learned to do. But now, if you look at this specimen, you can see that in the upper part, the TME is perfect. You have had a good yeah. intact fascia, etc. Et but it, when it comes to lower part, you can see that there is a coning or a wasting of the specimen, which is known as a Morrison's waste. So this is the reason why the APR patients are not doing good as expected when compared to AR patients. So the lesion is here and where in, in, in the place where you actually want more of tissue around, there is a coning or wasting if you do the APR in the conventional way. So you should be doing APR in a different way. This particular aspect of the importance of doing an APR in a proper way was highlighted not by a surgeon, but a pathologist known as Philip Kirk. And he went around UK and found that from various centers, the specimens were looking good in the upper part, but in, in the lower part, the specimens were not looking good. That is, APR patients were not having a good specimen when compared to patients under no AR. That is the reason why APR patients were doing bad. You know the difficulties in doing an APR. One is the anatomical difficulties, the surgical techniques are different. The mesorectum, as you know, disappears at the upper part of the sphincters, and you know that the poor perineal surgeon is sitting in a very difficult position. The lighting is not good, the instrumentation is not good, or the senior surgeon has taken the better instruments or the better assistant area. You are more dis most discomfort position sitting and doing a perineal part of the APR. That is why that was not being done properly. You want to do a good APR. This is the way you should be doing it. The red. I hope I can. Uh, the pointer is working. So the first picture. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, Murli, the pointer doesn't seem to move. Fine, fine. So if you do the APR, yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. If you do the APR in a conventional way, then you will create a wasting over here, and this is the area where you actually want more of tissue around the specimen. That is what you should be doing when you do an extra levator APR. You should cut like this, go outside the levators and cut the levators as laterally as possible. So you have a more of chunk of tissue in the lower part, more of circumferential negativity and less of local recurrence. So this was a, this is a new change or I would say a change that has been uh, propagated or being talked about in all conferences, extra levator APR. But you very critically analyze it. It is not a new wine in a new bottle, it's an old wine in an old bottle. Why I say this, if you look at the original article published in Lancet in 1908 by famous uh, Ernest Miles, this is a picture that Ernest Miles drew in his, picture, in, in his article. This is the way he advised us to do APR. That is, in the lateral, lower part, he advised us to cut the levators as laterally and take out all the nodes in the mesorectum or in the perirectal tissue lower part. But somehow we had, we were focusing more on the abdominal part of surgery and were not doing the rectal part, perineal part properly. That is why APR patients are not doing good in spite of standardized tech, surgical techniques. So that is why you need to focus in patients, at least in patients who are undergoing APR, you should, the most important part of surgery is not the abdominal part. The most important part of surgery is the perineal dissection and that perineal dissection should be done in an extra levator pattern. And if time permits, I will show you a small video at the end of my presentation. So this is how a proper specimen should look like after a TME and extra levator APR. There should be a good chunk of tissue in the lower part and then you can assure that your circumferential resection are negative and the local recurrence is as less as any other patient. Now, another surgical aspect that I would like to touch upon is the need of high ligation in rectal cancer. We all know that you need to ligate the IMA at the root in case of left-sided colonic cancer and sigmoid cancers because they are the primary drainage area. 
But in case of rectal cancer, should we really go for a high ligation of IMA? That's a debatable question. And you can ligate the IMA high as shown in this picture, or just after a takeoff of the first colonic brand somewhere on the here. This has been analyzed in several studies, and this is a critical review which says that there is no need for going for high ligation for oncological reasons because the incidence of lymph nodes at the root of the mesentery in a rectal cancer is just about 1.7% and there is no difference in the survival, five year survival, there are 1,370 patients, not a small number. This has not been evaluated in a randomized way, but all these are retrospective studies. So, but there are two studies with significant number of patients, 1,188 and 1,370. The data coming up from those studies is that high ligation is not needed for oncological reasons because the incidence of nodal spread is pretty negligible and it doesn't have an impact on the survival. But if you want to ligate the IMA at the root for technical reasons, for example, you want the left side of the colon to come down into the, into the pelvis for a proper tension-free anastomosis, then you may do that. But don't tell me that you are doing it for oncological reasons, but you can do it for a surgical or technical reasons to have a better length of the proximal limb to have a tension-free anastomosis. But there are no oncological benefit for doing a high ligation in rectal cancer, but the picture is different in left-sided and sigmoid cancers where you have to do a high ligation to get a proper nodal clearance. Now, as you all know, rectal cancer is one area where there is higher chance of involvement of adjacent organs like the bladder, the prostate, uh, the seminal vesicles, in case of females, the vagina, the cervix, etc. So if those organs are involved, even after a neogen chemo radiotherapy, you have to go for multivessel resection because eccentric resections in terms of bladder resections, prostate resections, vagina, uterus, and posterior sacrum and the coccyx can be removed by doing an eccentration. The only contraindications for doing these kind of extended resections, lateral fixity, where you are sure that you won't get a negative margin. If you're sure that or if you think that you cannot, cannot get a negative margin along the lateral walls, then there is no point in doing eccentration. And in a patient who has got metastasis, there is no point in, 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 in going for eccentration. Otherwise, adjacent organ involvement is not a contraindication for surgery, but you should be prepared to do these sorts of multivisual resection and the reconstructions involved like a ileal conduit or a neobladder or whatever it is uh, uh, for that, so that you can, you can reduce the local disease. Now, again, the outcomes of this eccentration are also not bad because you can see that the five-year survival after, 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 uh, after an eccentration is somewhere around five-year survival is 64%, 49%. differs from series to series, but if you can do that, you can assure a 5 year survival at least in 30 to 40 percent because no other modality can offer a 5 year survival 30 percent in advanced rectal cancer. So you should go ahead with, with advanced resections in lesions involving adjacent organs. Now, the third change or the most important change that has taken place as rectal cancer is concerned is that I said initially the change from adjuvant setting to new adjuvant setting. Urgent. We should all be very sure about the concept of new agent radiation rectal cancer because the patient comes to us and we are the people who should be deciding what should be the treatment and what should be the new agent treatment that our patient is going to get and when we can operate this patient. Again, we knew that from time and more, we knew that uh, if you do surgery alone, it's not enough because if you do surgery alone, even if you've got good TME, the recurrence is about 10 to 12 percent and recurrent rectal cancers are very difficult to treat pain, hemorrhage, the bony involvement, the diagnosis usually delayed. And again, this leads on to distant metastasis. The patient may survive for longer, but the quality of life is very poor if a patient recurs locally. So local recurrence should be prevented and surgery alone is not enough for locally adult rectal cancer. So you need to add on something and that addition is in the form of radiation. And again, if you look at historical series, colon cancer, the survival is 25%, rectum survival is 50%. That's what I said, rectal cancer survival is good. But the problem is that rectal cancer recurrence is more, 30% when compared to 5% colonic cancer. So you have to tackle this local recurrence of rectal cancers. And from 1980s onwards, there have been four important trials, GITSCG trial, the NCCG trial, the NSFE-R1 trial, and the R2 trial, all use various modalities of post-operative chemoradiotherapy in stage two and stage three patients. That is locally advanced rectal cancers and prove that you can reduce the local recurrence by 30 to 35 percent without major impact on overall survival. The only thing addition of radiation does is that it reduces the local recurrence. So based on these four trials, post-operative radiotherapy or post-operative chemo radiotherapy became the standard of care for all locally advanced rectal cancers in 1990s, right? But after 1990s, over the last two decades, so many things have changed. 
nine major randomized control at least gi surgical oncology pgs and 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 mca gi surgical oncology research pg should know that all these trials have got its own importance the swedish trial the dutch trial the norway trial the mrc trial the german trial the nsap trial the urtc trial the trog trial and the stockholm one two three all of us should be pretty aware at least regarding the basic concepts about these trials i have given three different colors for these trials if you care to look at it the first four are red in color because they are short course rt trials the next three are green in color because they are long course chemo radiotherapy the last two are given in orange because they are a combination of this. so this concept should be very clear to us so we have two options so for all locally advanced rectal cancers today the standard of care is not post operative chemotherapy but it is new adjunct chemo radiotherapy because it helps in tumor downstaging attaining more of r0 resection or cr and negativity reduces the local resections local recurrence and more importantly it increases the sphincter preservation rate which is very important for surgeons like us and it is well tolerated by the patients in the pre operative stage rather than the post operative period because post operative radiation has got its own complications when compared to pre operative so in any scenario if i am given an option i would prefer pre operative radiation than post operative radiotherapy because the short term toxicity and the long term toxicity are lesser with pre operative radiation than post operative so today the standard of care for any locally advanced rectal cancer and when i say locally advanced rectal cancer i mean t3 t4 and no positive patients as diagnosed by the initial mri so if the initial mri says that it's a t3 lesion or t4 lesion or a no positive patient he should go for new adjuvant radiotherapy and the three important things for a surgeon is choosing the right protocol and then addressing the perioperative issues because the patient has been irradiated and the sphincter preservation so how do you choose a patient for pre operative radiation as i said earlier there are two modalities of giving radiation one is a short course rt and the second one is long course rt the short course rt is 25 gray in five fractions so it starts on a monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday the radiation is over you take up the patient for surgery the next week that is within 7 to 10 days so the entire treatment gets over within 10 to 15 days that is the biggest advantage of short course rt long course rt 50.4 grain 25 fractions 25 fractions means 6 weeks so after that you wait for 6 to 8 weeks for the impact of radiation to act and then you operate after 6 to 8 weeks so the entire treatment is bit long and then all these patients receiving long course radiation and then undergoing surgery will then have adjuvant chemotherapy also this concept should be very clear short course rt is 5 days of radiation followed by surgery no chemotherapy but if it's long course chemo radiation then you have 50 gray in 25 fractions followed by delayed surgery that is after 6 to 8 weeks and then after surgery you will have to give this patients adjunct chemotherapy that is the standard protocol but the question before a surgeon is how do you choose between these two whether you should send for a short course rt or a long course chemo rt i would say simple method if you look at the mri you can again categorize all this locally advanced rectal cancers into three groups all t3 are not the same T3 means involvement of perirectal fat tissues, mesorectal fat. This can be T3A, bit of involvement of the perirectal fat. T3B, bit more involvement. T3C, almost reaching up to the mesorectal fascia. So based on this, you can say that this is a good patient, this is a bad patient, this is ugly patient, and this is a very ugly patient, T4 patient. So based on the MRI report, you classify patients into good locally advanced. bad locally advanced and ugly locally advanced this will help you to decide on choosing between short course and long course chemo okay this is an algorithm i'll send 2 minutes on this if it's a good patient early t3 with nodes being negative if you operate the recurrence is going to be less than 5% and this patient needs surgery alone because addition of radiation therapy is not going to add any more to this so you just can go ahead and do a tm in this patient early t3 lesions t3a node negative but if it's a bad lesion t3b or node positive if you operate the recurrence rate is on 10 to 15% so you have to give some sort of new adjunct treatment i stop a new adjunct treatment if it's ugly lesion t3 t4 and extensive nodal disease you can opt you cannot operate if you operate you end up with recurrence of 20% again this patient also would need a new adjunct treatment so how will you different between these two groups i'll tell you this particular group can go for short course rt and then operate whereas the other group has to go for a long course chemo rt so this is the way i would like to put it the locally advanced rectal cancers you have to divide into good bad and the ugly the good patients can go for primary surgery 
that that patients have to go for neoadjuvant treatment and that neoadjuvant treatment can be short course provided your radiation oncologist or your team is is comfortable doing short course surgery because i don't know how many centers are practicing the concept of short course surgery because but this is a very practical practical option the treatment finishes off within about 20 25 days and the patient goes home after completing radiation and surgery also if you cannot do that you you have to go for long course chemo sorry no the second question is once you have chosen the right patient for the right treatment modality what are the peri operative issues we are all concerned about the post operative leaks especially the patient has had radiation and we know that if you have given a radiation pre operatively the incidence of leak is much higher than patients who are not receive radiation and the incidence of leak doesn't differ between short course rt and long course rt that's one point i want to stress across for all surgeons don't be scared or afraid about short course rt because you are radiated the last week and you're going to operate this week is the leak rate going to be higher there has been a comparison of leak rates between short course and long course there is no major difference whatever it is if you are given radiation there is higher incidence of leak rate and again the german data the mrc data and the dutch data all shows that the leak rates is higher if you are irradiated and again we are all concerned anastomosis and irradiated edematous problem and the most important problem is a dramatic presentation of a leak we all as surgeons would do a leak test before closing the abdomen but in spite of the leak test being negative some patients do leak and for the first 3 4 days we won't pick up the leak because the patients have a bit of a pain the tachycardia some small amount of tachycardia would be there small one or two spikes would be there but you would be confident that the leak test was negative and this cannot leak but after 3 4 5 days the leak manifests frankly and by this time the patient may develop septic complications and associate morbidity and mortality but the point i look at is that this patient can be salvaged by doing an emergency diversion stoma if you are not done a stoma initially but the problem is that once a patient develops a leak and then you do a diversion stoma most of the time you won't be able to reverse the stoma because that leak is a major leak and it won't heal and you won't be able to close the stoma that is why most of us have a tendency to do a diversion stoma if it's a radiated patient more so because it is short course rt but i let me tell you that short course rt the leak rates are not higher than long course rt it is same and again it's a choice between ileostomy and colostomy again it depends upon which institute you are practicing at least my institute we do ileostomy there is nothing to differentiate between ileostomy and colostomy but one randomized control trial has shown that ileostomy is better than colostomy as a diverting procedure and again there are two types of anastomosis you would like to do one is a end to end anastomosis and other is a side to end anastomosis again you would think that side to end anastomosis is better because the vascularity is better in the side but again there are randomized control trials which shown that there is no major difference between side to end or end to end anastomosis now the third point that i would like to discuss is the sphincter preservation we all think that sphincter preservation increases if you are doing a pre operative radiation that is based on this particular german data which showed that 39% sphincter preservation versus 19% sphincter preservation with preoperative radiation that is why you believe that if you give preoperative radiation you can increase the sphincter preservation by 20% but as surgical oncologists or gi surgeons if you look at it more critically you will understand that this particular group of patients with lesions at around 3 to 4 cm there is no major increase in sphincter preservation rate but this group of patients by the way 3 cm 2 cm i don't think you will be able to preserve the sphincter by doing a anterior neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy but the patients who have lesions at 5 6 cm bulky lesions to give radiation and downstage and they are responding properly you will be able to stay save the sphincters in a large number of patients but not in patients with lesions at 1 2 3 4 cm patients with lesions at 1 2 3 cm the respect of what the response to radiation is sphincter preservation would be difficult unless you are going for an intersphincter preservation and a follow in an anastomosis otherwise patients with lesions at 5 to 6 cm a significant number of the patients can be converted to sphincter preserving surgeries by giving neo adjuvant radiation and the incidence of increase of sphincter preservation 20% increase in sphincter preservations again let me talk about minimal invasive surgery in rectal cancer i know that byju senavidan sir was the first person to come online and talk to me before starting this lecture and he and we are, we are all not against sphincter preservation surgeries because i believe that rectal cancer surgery sphincter preservation i mean uh, minimal invasive surgery is the way forward but it has been slow to take off and compared to other organs basically in oncology uh, minimal invasive surgery has been a bit late to uh, start up because of concerns regarding the radicality of surgery modal clearance short term long term outcomes the cost color and the classic trial proved that minimal invasive surgery is as good as open surgery for colon cancers but when it comes to rectal cancer 
in a scientific forum, if you ask me evidence for rectal cancer, minimal invasive rectal cancer, I am a bit skeptical because the ECOSOC trial and the Alacarta trial showed that there is some problem with with minimal invasive in rectal cancer because in terms of local recurrence as well as the completeness of mesorectal resections, it was shade inferior to open surgery. I don't know the reason for that because all these studies were done in high volume centers having a significant number of minimal invasive surgery, but in a randomized trial, the results somehow show that this minimal invasive surgery is not as good as open surgery, but I'm, I'm not against minimal invasive surgery, but I strongly believe that minimal invasive surgery should be for, but you should have had a good learning curve. You should stick to the oncology principles in terms of attaining a complete mesoreflexation. reflexation. If you can do that, it's good enough, but in a scientific point, you ask me, is there evidence or is the evidence in favor for minimal invasive? I would say it is not. Uh, Patasar, do you have another 15, 10, 15 minutes you more? have enough time, you can go for any length of time. We have more than two, 250 people watching you, so it's a record audience, so you can go on to whatever time. Few more things I would like to touch upon is the margins in rectal cancer surgery. How do you treat oligometastasis, the concept of non-operative management, and if time permits, I'll touch upon ERAS in rectal cancer and lateral nodal dissection. At least the white ones I will touch upon, the red ones I will leave it for discussion. So, again, commonly asked questions, how much margin should we give? We should all understand that we are dealing with patients who are in pre-operatively radiated. I would say that in all these patients, negative margin is what would suffice. If you can attain a negative margin, please understand that the margin comes in in lesions at 4 cm, 5 cm. In a patient with a lesion at 10 or 12 cm, you can take 3, 4, 5 cm as you please. But you would be constrained for margins in lesions which are really low like the cancers where you want to somehow preserve the sphincter and give an AR for the patient. For lesions at 4, 5, 4.5 centimeter, a negative margin would suffice, but you should be sure that you're doing an on-table frozen section and making sure that the margins are negative. You don't need to go for one, two centimeter margin, especially if the patient has been given pre-operative radiation. That's one advantage. And one other way why how you can add on to your sphincter preservation numbers, give pre-operative radiation and get a negative margin. And again, says a margin greater, one, margins of one centimeter, as far as pathological margins are negative, that would suffice. That is, as long as final pathological margins are negative, that would suffice. Now, <clears throat> one another topic that I would like to touch upon is how would you treat oligometastasis? Because we come across, at least in some high volume centers, we come across a lot of patients presenting with rectal cancer with single liver lesion or two liver lesions. So the rectum is operable, it's still locally advanced, and the liver is or the lung is also operable. So how would you go about sequencing the treatment? This is very interesting for surgical oncology PGs and GI surgery PGs. For the rectum, as I said, you have to give radiation and operate. For the liver, you have to give surgery and chemotherapy. All these four modalities of treatment has to come together. How will you place it? Before going into how would you sequence this, I'd like to take you to the Stockholm 3 trial, which has changed the entire scenario of managing oligometastatic rectal cancers. There are three arms, short course RT, and immediate surgery within five days. Short course RT and delayed surgery. This was a new concept. We all thought that after short course RT, you had to operate within five to seven days. That's what I said initially. But you can delay the surgery even after a short course RT. Then the conventional chemo radiotherapy, long course chemo radiotherapy, and the delayed surgery. So these three arms were compared and they found that short course RT and delayed surgery is a practical option for rectal cancers and the results are as good as any other uh, sequencing modality. So, short course RT and delayed surgery has come up as a big boom or as a big helping hand for patients who have oligometastatic disease because once this has been standardized, sequencing treatment is very easy. This is the sequencing of treatment that we usually do. Locally advanced rectal cancer, we used to give long course chemo radiotherapy, wait for six to eight weeks, then operate and then give chemotherapy. And if the patient has a liver lesion, how would you do the liver lesion? Do you want to do the liver resection along the surgery for the rectum? No, I don't think anybody would like to do a rectal cancer surgery with the liver resection because one is that your access would be difficult. Accessing the pelvis and accessing the liver would be difficult. But if you can argue with me that you are a good laparoscopic surgeon and you can do both laparoscopically, but still I would say that most surgeons won't like to do a rectal resection laparoscopically and then do a liver resection combined because of the complexities of the surgery. The other option is to do it upfront. Go for liver resection, then start the treatment. Once the liver has been resected or the metastasis has been resected, then you can sequence your treatment assets. But the problem is that if the liver resection becomes complex, 
or if the liver resection ends up in some complication, then a treatment for rectal cancer would get too much delay. So you don't want to do the liver resection upfront. The other option would be to do the liver resection somewhere around here. Finish off the radiation for the rectum, operate the liver, then wait for six to eight weeks and then operate the rectum. Am I clear? I hope I'm clear. Or otherwise we can come back to this later. This was the way we used to conventionally do it, sequencing the liver resection. But once the Stockholm data came, it's very simple. You give radiation, five days, we can do the surgery after six to eight weeks. That is delayed surgery after short course RT. And during this time, immediately after finishing the radiation for the rectum, take up the patient for liver resection. The patient will improve and will, will the liver resection wound will heal and the patient will be ready for the surgery at the end of it. And then you can give the adjunct chemotherapy for the liver. So even now from this picture itself, we can see that all these things can be done within a short period of time when compared to the longer treatment schedule of the initial one. So once short course RT followed by delayed surgery became a standard or became evidence-based, liver resection or sequencing liver resection has become very easy. Do the short course RT, immediately operate the liver, wait for the patient to recover from that and then do the rectal cancer surgery and then give the chemotherapy for the liver lesion. So this is the way we would sequence in an oligometastatic lung or liver. Operate the liver after the short course RT. Hope I am clear and if there are any doubts regarding that, we can come back to the study. Again, so this is again the same slide I showed initially. Now I'll skip that slide. And another concept, why operate at all? You are given a good chemo radiotherapy and the patient has res responded and there is no lesion visible now. This is one patient who received, this is the patient at presentation, you have a significant lesion there. And after radiation, everything has disappeared. There's small discoloration there and the biopsy from this area is negative. What would you do? Do you want to really operate? That is what is known as the Haber Gamma's protocol. And again, <coughs> There were several studies over the last 10 years which looked upon the non-operative management for rectal cancer. Non-operative means you give chemo radiotherapy and the patient has responded or the lesion has disappeared, you won't operate. The problem is that of the 1,000 odd patients, 361 patients were from Haber Gamma series. Remaining 289 patients were from eight studies. So other surgeons are somehow reluctant to do it. And the results also shows that initial Haber Gamma series, the recurrence was 27%. But later on, Abergama has been able to reduce the local recurrence to 3%, 3, 5, 6%, 4.5%. So somehow this particular institute, the Sao Paulo Institute, or this particular surgical group led, led by Abergama have been able to prove that at least in their hands, in the way they do things, they have been able to observe these patients without local recurrence or local recurrence is just about 3%, which is something which needs to be uploaded. But when other people try to do it, you can see that the local recurrence is 38 percent. Sorry, I can't see that. The local recurrence somewhere around 25 percent. So the results have not been that good when this same thing was tried out in other centers. There's something to do with the way they choose their patients or give their radiation or follow up their patients or the natural history of their particular disease is different. Haber Gamma has been able to con consistently prove that you can observe at least a subset of patients, but when others try to do it, they have not been as successful. So today, if you ask me what is the what is the final take-home message on that, I would say that this is a review article published recently on non-operative management. They say that until long-term results are available, non-operative approach is proven beyond doubt. Surgery should be the standard of care. But at least in a small subset of patients who have responded excellently and the post-chemo radiotherapy biopsy is negative and the patient is reluctant to come for a surgery or doesn't want surgery and the sphincters are in question, APR patients, you can give an option depending upon your institute policy, but is it evidence-based? Are there randomized control trials? I would say a big no. Surgery should remain the standard of care. In trial situations, in experimental arms, you can do that. So that's what I wanted to cover our, on rectal cancers. And I think I've come to the end of my presentation. And I hope I have been able to convey what I wanted to convey. And I'm not disappointed, but other actions. So thank you so much for your patient listening and then open for discussion or questions or whatever. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. Very comprehensive, dealing with all the problems which we, I think it's a, is the whole thing in a nutshell, very well delivered. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Now, uh, now there will be a lot of questions and you have to face them. Uh, now, I, I suggest you to uh, raise your hands instead of... Uh, uh, I'll start with Basant Singh. Basant, what is your question? 
Basant, hello, what? hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my question is: in patients who have locally advanced uh, cancer, like a T4 cancer, which is involving the prostate or the bladder, and we give the new given therapy and post and therapy, there is a good response. So, do we go ahead and resect the bladder or prostate as determined uh, before the radiation, or we can do a lesser operation in these patients? That's a nice question because that question comes whenever you talk about breast cancer, BC, BCS after new agent chemotherapy. What should be the margins? And let me tell you the practical way where that we do it. Let me tell you, uh, if the bladder or the prostate have been deeply infiltrated pre-chemo radiotherapy, I rarely believe that the patient, the lesion will just detach from that and it will become free. These kind of situations occur in patients where the lesion is just abutting the prostate or the seminal vesicle. In those patients, if you give radiation, you can see that post-radiation, post there will be a plane between that and it's an on-table decision. If you can develop a good plane between the prostate or seminal vesicle, you have to go by the new margins and not by the initial, initial margins. But let me tell you, this doesn't happen in case there is a frank infiltration of the prostate or the seminal vesicle, because if it's a frank through and through infiltration, it's very likely that radiation will resolve that and the patient, those patients may end up in excentration or resection of that disnormal. These kind of situations are the kind of thing that you mentioned. Respond. If it's just abutting, a plane will develop after neogen chemo because of the periphery is sterilized. So that occurs in patients with T4A lesions, not in T4B lesions. Make clear? Uh, Dr. Yes. Bharat? Basant. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, no, one no, more question. Basant, sir. No, next, next question is from Bharat Veerabhadran. What is your question? Bharat is my colleague at RCC. Oh, really? He has a question too. I Fine. Will, uh, Dr. Santosh Anand. Dr. Santosh, your question. Sir, am I audible now? Uh, sir, this is Dr. Santosh. I'm a surgical gastroenterologist, sir. Uh, right. Sir, uh, while doing uh, ELAPI, uh, do you use flaps always? And uh, what is your take regarding uh, the uh, perineal wound healing following ELAP, following radiotherapy, sir? Fine. See, I know, I know that there are centers which conventionally do ELAP in a prone position and then this is the ELAP that we, we do it, just a video running shortly side by side. See, uh, let me tell you, at least from the way we do it RCC, we do ELAP in the pro, not in the prone portion, but in the normal supine portion itself. But if you can have a good visualizer, you can see in this picture that I'm going really laterally and cutting the levators. What remains is just the big global... Can, can you show the screen? Uh, well, it's not playing on the screen. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, fine, I'll show you the video. Do do? You can come out of uh, the slides and then if it's on a different, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me a minute, sir. Give me a minute, sir. Yeah, sure. Is it visible, sir? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Now, what you can say, the, the lateral part, and we are cutting the lab, levitus as much laterally as, oh, sorry. Okay, let me answer the question. See, for all elapse, you don't need a prone position and for all elapse, you don't need a flap over there. But if you're cutting the coccyx or a lower part of the sacrum and you think, think that the wound is large enough and the healing may be a problem, especially in post RT period, again, I would say it is an institute choice or your, 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 you can put a flap, but let me tell you, in our patients, we don't do a routine prone cushion ELAP and we don't routinely place a mesh over there or a flap over there. But again, uh, that's a matter of choice between depending upon your experience. If you have had a lot of wound infections and a flap failure, then put in a flap. There is no problem. Being in the vascular tissue is always good. But that cannot be uh, mentioned as a standard procedure because ELAP, when it started, all people thought that you had to put the patient in a prone cushion. But now we can do ELAP in the, lap, in the normal cushion itself. So flaps, no. But if you feel, you can do it. It's again your choice. Uh, Baiju, you have a comment on that? Uh, about uh, ELAP or what? Anything, sir. Anything. No, no. Uh, actually, um, I wanted to congratulate uh, Madhumarali for the brilliant talk. And Thank actually, you. the participants are close to 250. Um, uh, this you know, is the record a, uh, audience, I'll tell you. You yes. have a huge fans across the country. <laughs> Thank, you, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege. <laughs> Coming to the topic, uh, suppose on the lesion is, uh, the epicenter of a lesion is 
uh, above the peritoneal reflection, but still part of the lesion is going uh, below the peritoneal reflection. What would be the uh, adjuvant therapy for that patient? That's a very nice question, sir. That is the area which I tried to uh, touch upon initially. Sig you are not sure whether it's sigmoid or you are not sure whether it's upper rectum. Yeah. Again, I would say that you have to individualize the patient because whether you want to operate first or give chemo radiotherapy, because many a times we are seeing that we send the patient for neurogen radiation, upper rectal or sigmoid lesion, and the radiation of all send back patient that this cannot be read because as the lesion goes higher up, when you want to plan neurogen radiation, you should understand that a lot of small bubble will get irradiated as the lesion goes up. So you have to take that toxic into consideration. So if the lesion is just at the peritoneal reflection, then you have to go for neurogen. But if the major, majority of the lesion is above the peritoneal reflection, then you can go for upfront surgery because the benefit of radiation becomes lesser as you go higher. So primary surgery for lesions above peritoneal reflection is okay. But then you should be sure that it's a sigmoid lesion and you can, uh, and, but if there are significant nodal disease and major part of the lesion is coming below the peritoneal reflection, I would say that neurogen chemo radiotherapy or neurogen radiation should be. That's a bit of gray area you have to individualize patient by patient. So but the neurogen regarding the post-op uh, um, RT, yeah, that's right. the post-op RT, yeah, it all comes down to, it, so you have various methodologies to, dis see, for the radiation oncologists, they want to know whether it's a rectum or a sigmoid. And again, you know that uh, they, they, deny, they rely upon the pre-operative imaging, pre-operative colonoscopy finding, and the operation notes to decide on that. It is these three things that tell them whether it's a rectal cancer or a sigmoid cancer. CT scan can be very dissimilar because a redundant sigmoid can look like a rectal lesion. Similarly, endoscopy... No, uh, you will be, be knowing better than... You will be operating and the surgeon will be knowing better than any, any person... And That's exactly uh, what I said, sir. It is the surgical notes that is very critical. Even if you have done an AR for a sigmoid lesion, you should mention in your operation notes that it is sigmoid cancer so that the radiation oncologist will not give radiation but give adjunct chemotherapy. But if it's a rectum, please mention that rectum, then they will give adjunct radiation. So in every patient in our center for sigmoid lesions undergoing anterior resection, for example, for a sigmoid lesion, you would do anterior resection because you get the vascular controls like that. So the operation may be AR, but you have to clearly mention whether it's a sigmoid or rectal cancer in operation notes. It is a surgeon's word we, that we take as the last word to decide upon the adjunct therapy. Uh, Dr. Prasanna, Prasanna Gowda, what is your question? Dr. Prasanna, am I audible? Oh, Dr. Meghna? Please, sir, uh, in few books, it, um, options for anorectal reconstruction after APR have been described, like dynamic graciloplasty or antropyloric valve with or without graciloplasty, etc. Sir, I want to hear your word on this. Uh, Meghna, I'm sorry, I couldn't get your question. Can yeah, I uh, I, if I repeat, uh, she's talking about uh, after AP resection, uh, a gristleoplasty or a gastric antral interposition for a, a continence. Neosphincter reconstruction. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I don't have any experience on doing that or having seen that procedure, uh, procedure doing that. If there are anybody else who would like to comment on uh, reconstructions for sphincter tone, I don't think for malignancy that would be useful because all these patients would have a bad outcome because of the radiation and the radicality of surgery. So doing a, a sphincter, uh, well, like you said, a sphincter reconstruction mechanism may be an option for a benign condition. And I don't think it would be uh, a, an option for malignancies. I, I'm sorry that I'm not uh, able to answer that question because I have not done that or I have not seen anybody doing that for malignancies. If anybody in the panel can add on to that, I would, Patasar or anybody, sir, I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I agree with uh, Dr. Madhuburli saying that uh, uh, it's been tried. I think there are a few Chinese studies where they tried uh, uh, trying to create a new sphincter after an apiary section, but that, that, that doesn't seem to work out well. It's, it's not coming to work. Meghna, are you okay with that answer? One, one message that I'd like to give to the young surgeons or the post dads is that a good APR is much better than a bad ultra-low anti-resection. A good APR is better than a bad ultra-low anti-resection or intersphincter. But if you cannot give a continent sphincter, the patient will end up 15 to 16 to 20 times in the toilet per day, which is very distressing. So I would say uh, a good APR is much, much better than a bad intersphincter resection or a 
ultra low, ultra ultra low anterior section. I think that's a significant statement, Dr. Uh, Murli. I think that should be the statement of the day, actually, frankly speaking, because with the advent of uh, high-end laparoscopic surgeons, more and more people are going lower and lower and try to do something. And uh, I think this is an important uh, uh, statement of the day. Yeah, uh, uh, Baiju, you want to counter that in any way? No, I am not to counter, um, uh, counter that point actually. If you are good, uh, if you have good experience in doing ultra low angle section, interspinal resections, you can go ahead with, I think, uh, in my experience actually, I'm um, going ahead with uh, more, more of interspinal and ultra low angle section. I showed the data last day. Uh, regarding the rectal cancers and laparoscopy, Madhu, Madhu was uh, telling about the trials which is available, but you didn't uh, mention about the Korean trial which is available. Korean trial. Korean trial, which uh, actually they are advocating for a lot of uh, lesions also, even locally advanced with uh, short course and uh, long course RP. But what's your opinion about that? Yeah, this is the Korean trial was a positive trial, which was hugely in favor of neurogen chemo, I mean, I mean minimally invasive surgery. But the, the num but if you look at it, balance it again, I, I say, well, by you, sir, I'm not against minimally invasive surgery because you are one of the best minimally invasive surgeons uh, around and you would be doing all patients minimally invasive surgery, but I'm not refuting that. But in the scientific forum, if you want to place evidence in your hands and then decide, I think the evidence for colon is very much in favor. Evidence for many other things are very much in favor. But in rectal cancer, when people try to generate evidence, which becomes a problem in surgery and surgical but when you want to do it in a randomized way, the results of the randomized may not be in your favor. That is what the Alakata and the Akosov trial showed. But I do accept your observation that the Korean trial was in favor of minimal surgery, but the number of patients in the Korean trial when compared number of patients were a bit lower. The Alakata and Akosov had larger number of patients than the Korean trial, but I take the point that the Korean trial was hugely in favor. That is why I concluded that if you're a good laparoscopic surgeon, nothing is contraindicated with the word and do a good laparoscopic mm -hmm. minimal surgery for rectal cancer, especially for lower rectal cancer. Okay, uh, sir, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I need one uh, clarification regarding any change or any difference in adjuvant therapy uh, following any uh, short course uh, or long course uh, neo adjuvant therapy, sir. After resection. Okay, uh, let me tell you. Yeah, after any 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 sort of any sort of uh, neo adjuvant treatment, for example, if your if your institute practices a policy of long course chemo RT, then operate. Then all these patients should receive adjuvant chemotherapy for rectal cancer. Make it. But if your institute follows the policy of short course RT, then uh, are the slides back again, sir? Yeah. Uh, I want to share this slide. Okay. I'll try to put it. Uh, just hold on for a minute, sir. So I, I, the picture is more explanatory than anything. That's why I want to have the picture. Okay, fine. Now, this is a protocol. If you're going for a long course chemo radiotherapy, you wait for six to eight weeks, operate, and all these patients will receive adjunct chemotherapy unless they have PT, YP, T0, N0, M0. Hope I'm clear. If the final pathology after surgery comes as no residual tumor, then you can avoid the chemotherapy. Or else, all patients after long course chemo RT and surgery will get chemotherapy unless it is no residual tumor cells. But if it is short course RT, then it is just short course RT followed by surgery. This chemotherapy should be given only in terms of patient metastasis. So after short course RT, just surgery. There is no need for adjunct chemotherapy. But if it is long course chemo RT, all patients will receive adjunct chemotherapy unless they are. T0, N0, M0 after your surgery and radiation. Am I clear? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Clear, sir. Is there any uh, role for long course RT after a short course? And we are finding that the uh, lesion is locally advanced. Are you, sir? I didn't get your question. Suppose you have done, done a short course RT, I have done the surgery. Okay. And, you are, and the post-operative pathology report is coming as a locally advanced. So what is your no, plan? No. Only chemotherapy? Let's be, let's, be, okay, okay. let's be very clear about that. Even if the short course RT is only 25, uh, 25, uh, 25 grain, 5 fractions, the radiobiological equivalence of both are same. The amount of radiation received by the rectum, both in short course RT and long course RT is the same. 
only thing is that the timing and the sequencing is shorter. So once you are given that much of radiation, you cannot re-irradiate the pelvis. So whether it's short course RT or long course RT, that's it. You cannot give any more radiation unless the patient has what's a local recurrence. What's your practice in RC? Are you giving a short course or a long course? Yes. Maybe over the last six months, we are slowly shifting towards short course RT. And today, I think we have about 150 or 200 patients who have received short course RT and we are taken up for surgery. But I would say that this is more handy in patients who are oligometastasis because, as I said earlier, you can give short course RT. On the seventh or eighth day, you can take up a liver resection. So, within one week or 10 days, the rectum radiation is over and the metastasis is out. Then you can wait for the rectum. That's a very handy procedure in metastatic patients. In non metastatic patients, also, we are shifting towards short course RT and surgery. And I think we are accumulated around 150 or 170 patients over the last six months to eight months. We are slowly shifting towards short course RT. It's a viable option, and as surgeons, we need not be afraid about the sphincter or the or the operating field being bloody or anything. And the leak rates are seen. Uh, and again, as a policy, we divert all patients after short course RT as a standard procedure that, that we do. And another question: uh, in laparoscopy compared to open surgery, usually we can send the patient postoperatively for adjuvant immediately after surgery, within on one or two weeks within uh, after surgery. Is there any study showing uh, uh, the difference? Sir, if you're talking about ERAS protocols and early discharge and uh, the concept or the contributions of minimally minimal surgery for towards ERAS protocol and early discharge, I would say that not, there is definitely... Not early discharge. Early uh, start of um, adjunct therapy. Uh, so however early you want to start it, uh, the thing is that after surgery, the patients by histopathology will take at least one week to 12 days to come. Right. And then... Uh, uh, that's what... Yeah. Within one week, we can start up uh, radiotherapy in the immune university. Yeah. But usually we uh, don't tend to do that, sir. We wait for... If, it's, uh, if it is post-opted radiation, we really want the anastomos to heal properly before adding radiation. But all these patients have received pre-operative RT. So we are talking about only post-opted chemotherapy, which can be started at two weeks. But again, we, we take a call based on the patient's situation. Standard three weeks. That's the standard that we call in our system. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, what about covering? Uh, what about covering uh, stoma or keeping ghost ileostomy? Because it is not every time every patient will leak and uh, reduce the morbidity of uh, closing the stoma, sir. Definitely, your point is well taken. Uh, again, see, when you want to talk in a scientific forum, you have to talk based on evidences. These are things not which have evolved. Uh, not based on any evidence, but institute-based practices. For example, I know that Ayyapan sir from Chennai, uh, he does a gauze teleostomy and then if the patient doesn't have any post-operative problems in terms of leak or tachycardia or tachypnea, he just closes the gauze teleostomy and sends the patient. So again, I would say that uh, you can do a gauze teleostomy if, you are, if your institute has that policy. But again, uh, these are not any evidence-based practices, but experience-based practices which are good enough for that particular surgeon or that particular institute. And uh, if you're comfortable doing a gauze teleostomy, fine, no problem, because you can avoid another surgery because once you do ileostomy or colostomy, you have to call back the patient for a stoma reversal. And again, stoma reversal is not a very easy surgery. Most of the time, we end up in most lots of problems in stoma reversals because stoma itself has got its own complication in terms of parastomal hernias, uh, bleeding, maintaining the stoma is a problem. Uh, so if you don't want to do stoma, I'm okay with that. But then you should be able to keep your leak rates as low as possible. Second, if you want to do a ghost ileostomy or a ghost colostomy, okay with that. Then again, I would say it's all personal preference or institute-based preferences. No uh, points against that or for that. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Pata is there? Sir, in a case of uh, obstructed uh, CA rectum with uh, oligometastasis in the liver, okay. what is your treatment approach, sir? Is it a short course chemo radiation or uh, we, should, uh, we should go ahead with long course, wait for some time and then? You're talking about a frankly obstructed patient or a semi-obstructed patient. If you're talking frankly about obstructed. Patient, yeah, frankly obstructed patient, whether it's metastatic, oligometastatic or not, the first preference should be given to relieve the symptom of the patient. So that is, you have to relieve the symptom. You cannot put a patient on radiation or chemotherapy in an obstructed patient. So what I would suggest is do a diversion stoma. Then once the diversion has been done and the stoma is working, it is as normal as any other patient. So you can choose between short course RT or long course RT depending upon uh, how you want to sequence your liver resection and rectal resection. So I would say 
divert the patient, make the patient any like any other patient, eat, make him eat, make him pass tools to the stoma, and then he becomes normal in one week. His nutrition status improves, his bowel movement uh, becomes normal, and then take him as any other normal patient. Uh, sir, what is your uh, choice of the uh, diversion uh, versus a uh, transverse uh, loop versus uh, ileostomy? If I heard it correctly, you are asking me the difference between loop stoma and loop ileostomy. Loop ileostomy versus transverse col uh, colostomy. Yeah, definitely. As I said earlier, it's again, it's 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 a choice of your own choice, institute based practices. But if you want to, if you are asking me evidence for that, I would say that there are one or two randomized control trials that compared ileostomy versus colostomy and showed that ileostomy shade better than colostomy in terms of uh, complications related to stoma, complications related to reversal. But generally, we tend to believe that colostomy would be better because it is formed stools that is coming through the colostomy whereas in terms of ileostomy it is more of watery content which would be difficult to manage perioperatively for the patient. The stomach bag may not stick, you have to frequently replace it but at least the evidence if you're asking me it is in favor of ileostomy rather than colostomy but again I would say yeah, you can have your own practice colostomy versus ileostomy and uh, every, if you're asking that is what I said, your own personal choice or institute based choices. Uh, sir, how do we proceed with lung oligometastasis, sir? Same thing, as I said, the same same picture. If you can see the slides in front of you, if it is lung or liver, it doesn't make any difference. I would be more comfortable operating the lung because it is in another yeah, biological. Basically. It's another biological compartment. So give short course RT, operate the lung. Can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you, you give short course RT for the rectum, operate the lung or the liver, whatever it is, and then wait for six to eight weeks and then come back for the surgery for the rectum. That's what that's what I said. Whether it's lung lesion or liver lesion, the principle should be same. If you can attain an R0 resection wherever it is, and the patient can withstand both these surgeries, you should not have a situation where you operate the lung and then the patient in certain complication doesn't come back ever for the rectal cancer surgery. So you should choose your patients correctly. Oligometastatic by itself is not good because it is synchronous metastasis and you would understand that metachronous metastasis is always better than synchronous. I hope I'm clear. Metachronous metastasis is always better than synchronous metastasis because you have a patient presenting a stage 4. It's a bad prognosis factor but still you have to choose your patient properly and sequence your lung or liver resection depending upon this particular diagram I would show. This is what we follow at RCC currently for oligometastatic patient whether it is lung or liver. Sir, after new adjuvant therapy, when would you prefer to repeat imaging and what imaging would you prefer? Very good question. And again, uh, I would say again after a new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy or because after short course RT and immediate surgery, you don't have time to image. That's, for, that's why in a short course RT immediate surgery, we don't re-image. But short course RT delayed surgery or long course RT delayed surgery in these two arms, we do image the patient at around four weeks. At around four weeks. And mm -hmm. that imaging should be MRI. Again, as I said, if you are good in reading, but then all of us should become good in reading MRI. We are all very comfortable reading CT scans, but we should also become good in reading MRI, which is not a very big task. If I had time, I would have said on what are three things that you should look in an MRI. I don't have the images. But there are three things that you should look in MRI, three images. And if you are good in reading at these three things, you are good, good in MRI and MRI should be the initial imaging modality as well as a re-imaging modality. And the re-imaging is done at four weeks after completion of the radiation. That would be around two weeks prior to surgery. Uh, sir, uh, uh, following uh, ultra lawyer or anterior resection, if anastomotic recurrence is found, uh, is there any role for local resection, sir? Or how do you, we have yes. to approach, sir? Yes, yes. Again, as I said earlier, either in the primary setting or in the recurrent setting, if you can attain an R0 resection, resection should be the standard. But you should understand that most of the local recurrences are not anastomotic recurrences, provided your initial margins were negative. If the initial margins were negative, there is no reason why the patient should have an anastomotic recurrence. But the recurrence can occur outside the lumen. In the, in the periphery. But then picking up these lesions is a major problem because most of the patients are asymptomatic till the tumor becomes large enough. And again, you cannot differentiate between post operative changes and tumor. Somebody's uh, audio has to be muted, I think. So if you can pick up lesions in an operable state, whether it's anastomotic recurrence or extra anastomotic recurrences, and you feel that you can attain a negative resection, 
even by doing an excentration lab, uh, like yeah. a, for example, recurrences most of the time would be adherent to the prostate, the seminal vesicle, or posterior to the sacrum, coccyx, etc. So you should be prepared to do these extended resections. And I don't find any contraindication if you can attain a negative resection. Only thing is that how early can you pick it up? And how can you manage that? Because anastomotic recurrences will manifest early because the patient will have symptoms of bleeding or something. But extra anastomotic recurrence, most of the time, you don't pick it up early. Patient will complain of some vague perineal pain. And, and again, you do an imaging MRI and the radiologist says, suppose stop changes versus recurrence, it's not very clear. And the CEF, surprisingly, for rectal cancer doesn't go as high as you expect in colon cancer. In colon cancer, CE is more sensitive. But in rectal cancer, I don't think CE is as sensitive as in colon cancer. But if you can pick up a recurrence early, operate even by doing an excentration. Uh, Dr. Bharat, do you have a question, please? Uh, Dr. Robinson, yeah. Sir, uh, what about uh, drawn up enough excision? You did not talk about anything. Yeah, you are talking about early lesions, transanal excision. Get your point. Let me tell you, at least from the center I work or the experience I have, very rarely, very rarely, I said earlier, about 95% of our patients are locally advanced rectal cancer. But once in a while, we do get early lesions, but you should be pretty sure that you're doing dealing with the early lesion. For that, you have to do a truss and make sure that's a T1 or T2 lesion and there are no extra mesorectal, I mean, mesorectal nodes. If there are mesorectal nodes, there is no role for local excisions. But if you're sure that's a polypoidal lesion, which can be excised with T, that is a T1 lesion or T early T2 lesion, low grade lesions, and you can excise it in toto and get a negative margin on the deeper aspect without any nodes, then local resections are an option. And other things like TATME, etc., is coming up. But let me tell you, I don't have any major experience in doing trans anal total mesorectal excision. But local resections are an option for very early lesion. But you should be very sure that you are really dealing with early lesion. You should not end up in a situation margin positive because then it becomes a mess to localize the lesion and do a revision surgery. Okay, thanks, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, what is the uh, role of ERAS in rectal surgery, and what, what is the current status on bowel preparation? Do we do preparation in rectal surgeries? I have slides on ERAS protocol. Let me take, take just one slide on that. Okay, uh, then give, me, give me a minute. Give me a minute. I had I had slides on ERAS, but I purposefully avoided. Okay, right now uh, I'll have to unhide this slide. Okay, can you see the slide now? Yes. Yeah. These are the ERAS recommendations. Okay. Now I put something in green and something in red. But if you look at it very critically, you can see that all the green ones we are already doing, like. Opioid sparing, mechanical plus oral bowel preparation is accepted because I don't think laparoscopic surgeons would be happy doing without a preparation. Opioid sparing, thoracic epidural anesthesia, regular diet immediately after surgery, sham feeding, etc. The only three things which becomes difficult, at least in our scenario, is avoiding drains in rectal cancer surgery, which I find it a bit difficult to do. Urinary catheter should be removed within 48 hours. Once you've done a pelvic surgery and you've manipulated the autonomic nerves, I feel that the bladder dysfunction or initial uh, period, there will be some amount of bladder dysfunction if you try to remove the catheter before uh, 72 hours or four days. So we have a policy of retaining the catheter for five days and take it on the fifth day. Again, clear fluids up to two hours prior to surgery where many of the anesthetists are a bit reluctant to give feed the patient up to two hours prior to surgery. So if we can, if you are okay with that red things, it's ERAS. So ERAS protocol can be, but the point is that what do you gain out of that? Because all the randomized controlled trials done on ERAS and rectal cancer have proved that you can discharge the patient earlier. How early? On the sixth day, when compared to eighth day. But let me tell you, at Regional Cancer Center, even without practicing these red things, we, as a standard policy, take out the drains and catheter on the fifth day and discharge the patient on sixth day. We don't feed the patient till two hours. We don't. We do put drains and we remove the catheter. So it's a matter of your institute practice and most of the things that we're conventionally doing, we need to do. Don't put in a rice tube. You don't need a rice tube for rectal cancer surgery. Bowel preparation, we do it, especially for laparoscopic surgery for the ease of handling the bowel. And I don't think the bowel preparation will add on to your post-operative stay or anything like that. Speed of the discharge, it's possible. Fifth day or sixth day, you can do that. So how can we allow the patient to release? Feed. You're asking no. me to feeding? 
Yes, sir. How early can we allow the patient orally? Yeah, let me tell you, uh, uh, we always have fight. Bharat, you know, Bharat is my colleague in RCC. I'm very particular that the patient has given normal diet at least the next day. Normal diet the next day. You operate on a Monday, but the patient should be on normal diet on day two, on Tuesday. At least from Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday morning, the patient should be given. Even if you have operated early in the morning, in the, in the free lunch session, you can start feeding the patient by liquid diet or a black coffee in the evening itself. But if you're not comfortable doing that, at least on the next day morning, you should give him normal fluids and by afternoon, at least soft diet. I'm very particular in RCC about that. We do that and we don't have any food because most of these patients have a diverting stoma or the anastomosis is pretty low down loss and you have a lot of bowel secretions, 2,000 to 1,500 number of secretions coming from the gastric contents, biliary contents, pancreatic contents. So avoiding the patient not to take anything doesn't add or help anything. So if you're very concerned, don't give on the same day, but the next day onwards, as a policy, we start feeding. We make sure the patient goes back to so at least a soft diet. Soft diet means your kanji or a bread or something like that, at least the next day onwards. Sir, if a, if a lesion is close to sphincter and we do new adjuvant, sir, and in, uh, we see that uh, it has resolved, then, uh, sir, we go for lower ultra lower, we go for APR. See, again, I said earlier, it is about your on-table decision. The, uh, again, Patasar has agreed with me that a good APR is better than a bad ultra low anterior resection. So I would say one, two, three centimeter don't struggle for an ultra low anterior resection because the patient may end up miserably in 15 to 16 times in the toilet. Lars syndrome is a fact. If you look at patients or critically analyze with Lars, LARS, low anterior resection syndrome is a major problem. So for lesions at one, two, three, four centimeters, please do a good APR. But if the lesion is a 4 to 5 centimeter, you want to preserve the sphincter, you're okay with that. But it is the on-table PR examination that is going to decide the sphincter preservation. And inter-sphincter resections are all possible. So I would uh, say take a call based on the on-table per rectal examination. Sir, so on, that, on that note, I think we'll close the meetings already. You must be very tired, sir. We shall catch up with you again in the next meeting. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Madhav. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bharat wanted to ask you. Sorry, Bharat, I couldn't answer your question. Actually, the, there's so much audience for you. Uh, I should tell you, there's a record audience, 250 plus. Thank it you so much. It's a pleasure, precious. I thought, I think I'm not disappointed in my first attempt online. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you